Moin, mein Name ist Toni, schön, dass du da bist und herzlich willkommen bei Mondgeflüster. Ihr wisst ja, dass dieser Kanal aus der Raumfahrtgeschichte entstanden ist. Vorwiegend damals wegen dem Apollo-Programm. Nun hatte ich ja vor kurzem die Ehre, eine absolute Legende aus dieser Ära zu interviewen, nämlich den ehemaligen Flight Director Jerry Griffin. Im deutschsprachigen Raum gehen die Teams hinter den Astronauten immer etwas zu Unrecht unter, aber nicht hier beim Mondgeflüster. Die Teams in Houston hatten einen sehr großen Anteil am Erfolg und die Prozeduren, Regeln und Traditionen werden heute immer noch größtenteils gelebt. Und damit ihr auch wisst, welches historische Schwergewicht ich da im Interview hatte, lasst uns einmal kurz auf den Lebenslauf schauen, bevor das Interview losgeht. Eins kann ich euch auf jeden Fall schon mal versprechen. Näher konnte man während den Missionen damals nicht am Geschehen auf der Erde dabei sein. Gerald D. Griffin wurde am 25. Dezember 1934 in Texas geboren und besuchte ab 1952 das College, um Luft- und Raumfahrttechnik zu studieren. Er gehörte vier Jahre lang dem berühmten Texas A&M Corps of Cadets an, einer militärischen Studentenorganisation und wurde nach seinem Abschluss 1956 mit dem Bachelor of Science als Second Lieutenant in die United States Air Force aufgenommen. Danach verschlug es ihn kurz nach Kalifornien, bevor er im Dezember 1956 in den aktiven Dienst berufen wurde. Wieder zurück in Texas begann er dort eine einjährige Navigationsausbildung mit intensiver Bodenschulung und Flugausbildung mit der Convair T-29, welche er mit dem Erhalt der US Air Force Navigator Wings Ende 1957 abschloss. Diese Ausbildung war der Grundstein für seine Karriere bei der NASA. Aber dazu gleich mehr. Anschließend wählte er die Ausbildung zum Radarabfangjäger. Diese sechsmonatige Ausbildung schloss er als zweiter seiner Klasse ab. Bis Ende 1960 war er wieder in Kalifornien stationiert, bevor er aus dem aktiven Dienst ausschied, wobei er insgesamt noch bis 1974 in der Reserve der US Air Force blieb. In der Zeit beim Militär legte er sich auch zwangsläufig eine gewisse Härte zu. Er selbst nennt das Narbengewebe. Dazu zählten zum Beispiel solche harten Erfahrungen wie zum Beispiel morgens noch mit dem Piloten Kaffee zu trinken, der dann am Nachmittag nicht mehr wiederkommt. Auch damit umgehen zu können, sich solcher Risiken bewusst zu sein, trotzdem weiterzumachen, sei sicherlich keine schlechte Voraussetzung für die Arbeit in der Mission Control gewesen. Dies betont er öfter selbst. Unmittelbar nach seinem Ausscheiden aus dem aktiven Dienst trat er im Januar 1961 eine Stelle bei einem Unternehmen als Raketensystemingenieur an. Dieses Unternehmen war der Hauptauftragnehmer für den Flugbetrieb im US Air Force Satellite Test Center und war für die Überwachung der Satelliten zuständig, die von der Vandenberg Air Force Base in Kalifornien in eine polare Umlaufbahn gebracht wurden. Dazu zählten also auch die frühe Ära von Aufklärungs- bzw. Spionagesatelliten. Hier hatte Griffin übrigens die ersten Berührungspunkte mit Agena Oberstufen, die ihr bereits aus dem Gemini-Programm kennt, wenn ihr das hier schon verfolgt habt beim Mondgeflüster. Hier sammelte Jerry Griffin also erste Erfahrungen in der Echtzeitflugkontrolle während des Starts, in der Umlaufbahn und während des Eintritts von Raumfahrzeugen. Er führte dabei Systemanalysen der Satelliten und der Agena Oberstufe durch, die auf den Tor- und Atlasträgerraketen eingesetzt wurden. Griffins Hauptfachgebiete waren Leit-, Steuerungs- und Antriebssysteme. 1962 kehrte er nach Texas zurück wo er leitender Systemingenieur bei einer Firma war, die sich Anfang der 60er an Studien über Weltraumsystemen wagte. Griffin war da an der Forschung und Entwicklung von Leit- und Steuerungssystemen für Flugzeuge und Raumfahrzeuge beteiligt. Im Juni 1964 begann dann für Jerry Griffin die Karriere bei der NASA. Er war dort im Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston angestellt. Was der Grund bzw. das Schlüsselerlebnis war, sich der Raumfahrt zu widmen, wird er euch aber gleich selbst erzählen. Im Gemini-Programm kam ihm bereits die Erfahrung mit den Agena-Oberstufen zugute, sodass er zunächst als Agena Flight Controller eingestellt wurde. Der allgemein als Agena bezeichnete Zielflugkörper diente im Gemini-Programm dafür Rendezvous und Kopplungsmanöver zweier Raumfahrzeuge zu erproben. Dies war auf jeden Fall unerlässlich für die Ziele während Apollo, denn durch die Entscheidung des Lunar Orbit Rendezvous waren Dockingmanöver essentielle Vorgabe für die Zielerreichung. Ziemlich schnell wurde er im Gemini-Programm in der Flugkontrolle dann zum GNC berufen. Der Guidance Navigation and Control Officer überwacht die komplette Navigations- und Flugsteuerungshardware des Raumschiffs während der Mission. Hier kam Griffin die Ausbildung bei der US Air Force zugute. Auch im Apollo-Programm sollte die Navigation sein Spezialgebiet bleiben, doch dann kam der Unfall von Apollo 1. 
Durch die Untersuchung des Feuers in der Kapsel verzögerte sich der Zeitplan von Apollo. In dieser Zeit wurde Jerry Griffin zum Flight Director befördert und überwachte als Leiter des Gold Teams mehrere Missionen. Unter anderem saß er als Schichtleiter beim Start von Apollo 12 und 15 an der Konsole. Apollo 12 wurde ja beim Start zweimal vom Blitz getroffen. Und sein E-Com im Team, John Aaron, rettete mit tri sce to orks förmlich die Mission vor einem Abbruch. Was Jerry in diesen Sekunden durch den Kopf ging, erzählt er euch natürlich im Laufe des Interviews. Mit seinem Team führte er aber nicht nur Starts durch, sondern überwachte 50% aller Mondlandungen. Und zwar jene von Apollo 14, 16 und 17. Ebenfalls sollte er mit seinem Team die von Apollo 13 überwachen. Bekanntlich mit anderem Ausgang als geplant, war er mit seinem Goldteam an wichtigen Abschnitten der Mission beteiligt, die den erfolgreichen Fehlschlag am Ende recht glimpflich ausgehen ließen. Später wechselte Jerry Griffin ins Management der NASA und war stellvertretender Direktor des Kennedy Space Center in Florida und des damaligen Dryden, heute Armstrong Flight Research Center in Kalifornien. Er war außerdem stellvertretender Verwalter für Außenbeziehungen und stellvertretender Verwalter für gesetzgeberische Angelegenheiten in der NASA-Zentrale in Washington DC und von Mitte 1982 bis Januar 1966 Direktor des Lyndon B. Johnson Space Center in Houston. Sein erster Job nach dem Wechsel in die Privatwirtschaft, übrigens wenige Tage vor Challenger, war der des Chefs der Handelskammer von Houston. Danach war er vor allem als Berater verschiedener Unternehmen nicht nur aus dem Bereich der Raumfahrt tätig. Nebenbei machte er auch einen Sprung ins Filmgeschäft als technischer Berater für die Filme Apollo 13 Contact oder Deep Impact. In den letzten beiden hatte er Kurzauftritte als Schauspieler, natürlich in der Rolle des Flight Director. Ja, ich hoffe, ich konnte euch einmal einen kleinen Einblick geben, mit wem ihr das hier im Interview eigentlich zu tun habt. Er kannte sie echt alle und war so nah dran in der Apollo-Zeit wie nur wenige Menschen. Außerdem ist Jerry sowas von sympathisch und hat mir im Vorfeld des Interviews so ein bisschen die Aufregung genommen. Vielen Dank auch an Karin, die mir die Chance ermöglicht hat und mir als Sidekick im Interview beigestanden hat, weil mein Englisch so la la ist. Daher hat sie selbstverständlich selbst auch einige Fragen gestellt. Wer nicht so gut Englisch kann, der nutzt ab jetzt einfach die Untertitelfunktion hier bei YouTube. Wir haben das komplette Transkript sauber übersetzt. Ich wünsche euch ganz viel Spaß. <laughs> today, uh, today I have the great honor to have a flight director legend as an interview guest. Welcome, Mr. Gary uh, Jerry Griffin. Sorry, and thank you for this opportunity. I'm very glad to have you here. Thank you, Tony. I'm glad to be here with you. Thank you, and hello, and welcome, Kari, Karin, and thank you for making this possible. I have explained a lot in advance, so let's start with our questions. Jerry, I've already uh, informed our viewers briefly with the opening video and introduced you and your career. Looking back on your career, was there a specific key moment when you said to yourself that space travel thing could be something really big and that you want to be a part of it? Absolutely. Um, I had uh, graduated from Texas A&M University. I got commissioned in the uh, United States Air Force um, because I was in what we call ROTC, um, Reserve Officer Training Corps. And so I was commissioned when I graduated as a second lieutenant in the Air Force. And I was in a fighter squadron in uh, California after I had finished my flying training and all. And um, that's when Al Shepard uh, took his ride down the Atlantic just in a ballistic um, ballistic flight. And, um, and I said, golly, that looks interesting. And talk about flying high and fast, that's as high and fast as it gets. And, um, and then of course, uh, shortly thereafter, Gagarin, went into orbit um, shortly there, not too long there after uh, Project Mercury really got off the ground and running and, and we were planning to launch uh, John Glenn, the nation launch. And about that time I said, you know, that's where I really want to be. I want to be in the space business. And, and it took me a while 
because I still had an Air Force commitment. I had I was on active duty for four years. And so I got out and finally made my way to NASA in 1964. And from that time on, I knew I'd made the right decision. It was, it was, uh, we had, NASA had just finished Mercury when I showed up. And so I got involved in all of Project Gemini, and then the Apollo program. And by the way, I've always put Mercury, Gemini, and 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 uh, Apollo in the same. They were the same program. We were trying to learn how to get to space and onto the moon um, to fulfill President Kennedy's projections. So uh, it was a whirlwind. And uh, I immediately went to the control center when I got there as a flight controller. And um, I was 29 years old, and I was one of the oldest people in the room. Uh, it was it was a bunch of young young guys that uh, were trying to figure it out. So yeah, I can remember those days very vividly about how I got turned on to it and how it was the best decision I ever made. Oh uh, yeah, I I can understand this. <laughs> um, in another interview, you once said that as a flight controller or flight director, it is very important to be able to listen well. How do you manage to follow four or five or more, more audio channels? Is it something you can learn or does a flight controller have to have a certain talent? I I think you can learn it, but I think you have to have the basic skills to do it. Some people um, just can't process more than one input at a time. I got to, to the point, and of course, being in the Air Force and talking to the ground and talking to other aircraft and talking to, to all kinds of talking to your, maybe a guy in the airplane with you, uh, you had to multitask your audio and your voice. And um, I got to the point in Apollo that I could probably listen to five loops, uh, five communication loops at the same time and pick out what I needed from each of them. And and that's particularly true when you're a flight director. Now, when I was a flight controller, it was more I was talking to my back room and talking to the flight director. But when you're a flight director, you got about 20 guys that are trying to talk to you. And you're listening to those critical uh, com communication loops. And um, and you could always hear flight. When, when they were calling you, they flight, this is so-and-so. Uh, and immediately I could pick that out and go right to them uh, because they had something to tell me important. Uh, but I, I think it's a skill that can be developed. I think you got to have the basic basic uh, DNA to do it, though. I think you just got to bring it out. And um, some people can't do it. I know a lot of, of my friends uh, can't talk to can't talk to me and talk on the phone at the same time. So, you know, it's kind of a similar deal. And, uh, and, uh, but I, I, it was, let me tell you another thing about that. All of that development and, and pressure, let me call it that in those early days, it, it was uh, fun. Uh, it was fun to take the challenge. And one reason for that was because of our, our age, we were all young and, And um, we knew this was an unproven uh, technology and an unproven thing to do. So in many ways, we kind of had the latitude to structure it ourselves. Uh, many of the practices as the program developed uh, came from within. Uh, we didn't have to, there was nobody else to ask yeah. about it because nobody else had ever done it. And um, so it was, that part was fun to develop that <laughs> capability. Okay. Fun, uh, fun is uh, your, uh, uh, you, you wrote me, uh, uh, this will be fun. And uh, yeah, fun is uh, so important. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Jerry, we will talk about single missions in a moment. But if you had to choose, which Gemini and Apollo mission was your favorite? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> 
That's a, that's a hard question to answer. Yeah. But the reason is 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 because it's kind of like it's kind of like a question of who is your favorite child in your family, mm. <laughs> and I only have oh, two, yeah. and it would be hard to pick one over the other. Uh, but Jiminy, when we when we finally did a rendezvous. You see that day, you know, we do that so routinely now and it's automated and that kind of thing. We we thought rendezvous was gonna be extremely difficult. I mean, we were sweating it. Can you find another spacecraft up there in a vast volume? And uh it turned out not to be so hard. Uh we had a docking problem on Apollo 14, but and we had a problem with the Agena and Gemini, but but all of that, I think the Gemini flight, probably six, seven, where we, uh, where we've rendezvoused, the EVA on four was also okay, but it was not much. It was just opening the hatch and Ed White getting out, but I think on, uh, on Gemini six and seven, when we rendezvoused the two, uh, and we station kept, uh, which is what we were just going along in orbit and parked together and about 50 feet apart. Uh, it turned out not to be a big deal. But so I would put that in the, the rendezvous missions, actually, it was six and seven and uh, uh, Gemini. Apollo is really hard because um, 11, of course, was a giant step. Uh, and but, but but it was just landing and kind of getting out of there and getting what science we could uh, because the transportation system was not proven yet um, and so while it was a great accomplishment just to land on the moon it was probably even a greater accomplishment to get off the moon and get back to earth and uh, so 11 has to stand out. But the one that, that I was most proud of was personal, as a personal thing, uh, was probably uh, 13. Uh, we, uh, we were facing great odds there. And we could have lost that crew uh, after an oxygen tank exploded. And, uh, but we got them home. And, uh, oh, yes. And, and we got them home safely. And and I think that we never said it in the control center, but in the movie it was said, it was, I remember uh, Ed Harris uh, saying this was NASA's finest hour. And it, and it was probably Mission Control's finest hour, uh, for sure. Uh, and, you know, if we had lost that crew, the program would have probably ended. And... Uh, I, I have a suspicion it would, particularly after the fire on Apollo 1, there probably would have been naysayers that said, hey, this is just too dangerous, let's don't do it. And uh, we might have survived it, but we might not have. So I'd say I'd say 13 was probably the one. I was supposed to do, my team was supposed to do the landing, uh, the lunar landing. And uh, we had to become one of the teams that got them home. And so it was, it was good. Okay, thank you. Uh, Apollo 13, uh, we have a question for Apollo 13. Uh, so uh, in the later interview, but uh, I choose this one now because, uh, sure. yeah, because of your answer. Uh, you told us uh, your team and you were supposed to oversee the Apollo 13 moon landing. Uh, before priorities changed suddenly during the mission, uh, we all know. Can you still remember the moment when you were informed and what was going on inside you? Yeah, that was that was an interesting time. I had just, I got, my team ended a shift. We were coasting to the moon, uh, what we call translunar coast. Uh, it's pretty quiet. And uh, my team got off duty and handed, I handed, everything over to Gene Kranz. We debriefed with each with each other. He was the flight director on duty then and his team. And uh, I went outside and uh, changed clothes and went to play a uh, softball game 
on the uh, uh, nearby, and uh, I had we had just started the ball game, the the softball game, and um, they came out and got me and said, "You better get back to the control center. Uh, they got a problem going on." So I went. I said, "Okay." So I jumped in my car, went back to the mission control center. I walked into the to the flight director uh, or to the uh, the MOCA, we called it, the Mission Operations Control Room, which is what you see on TV, um, in my still in my uh, sweatsuit, uh, my in, in a ball cap. I had a ball cap on, and I noticed there were a few more people in the room, but um, it was uh, calm and quiet. Um, and I found out what had happened, and Kranz was about at the point at that time when he decided it was time to think about starting to get into the lunar module and use it as a lifeboat to get home. Thank goodness we still had the lunar module with us. Yes. Had that been after the lunar module, after we got the lunar orbit and the lunar module had landed, um, it wouldn't have worked. We couldn't have done it, couldn't have gotten them home. Um, but we had the entire lunar module uh, still on the dock to the command service module. So we uh, we had our lifeboat. Now, we had never simulated that failure, but we had talked about it, uh, the, using the lifeboat, using the lunar module as a okay. lifeboat, if you still had it. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a shocker, but you know, Apollo 13 was was a demonstration of what we had been trying to do uh, and say is that we could handle anything that we could handle. And, you know, we never ran out of options and we were trained to, as long as you had options, don't give up, keep going. And that's what we did. And it was, we never talked about not getting them home. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, because and I've had that question several times. Did you guys discuss uh, not getting home? No, we never did. It's because we never ran out of options, and it was a, a it was we were concerned, but we weren't scared. And that's what when Ron Howard, uh, the producer and director of the Apollo thirteen movie, the movie. He came and talked to a group of us, about six, half a dozen of us that were there. And he said, well, he kept asking the question. If he asked it once, he must have asked it a half a dozen times. Were you scared? And we kept saying, no, that's not the right word. We were, we were trained to handle um, this kind of thing. Whether we could get there successfully or not, of course, it was a question. But there was no sense moping about that. We had to stay on our task. And so, so it was, it was, 13 was, was very, very interesting. And, and the funny thing you ask about when I got notified, I was standing there and I realized in my absence or, or in my, I just didn't notice it. They had rescheduled the teams and I looked at it and I was going to come back and Glenn Lunny's team was coming in and I was going to relieve Glenn. Uh, which was not more than about 10 hours later. So I said, holy gosh, I got to get out of here, <laughs> go try to get some sleep. And I, I live very close to the center and I went to the, I went home. Um, and of course we, we had little kids by then. And, um, and I was concerned and I tried to sleep for a while. I, Finally got up after two or three hours and took a shower and went back to the control center because uh, I was afraid I was going to miss something. And uh, so, you know, there was that part in the thing, too, where, where all of us were, like I say, we weren't scared, but we wanted to be, a, didn't want to miss something that might be important. Please. And um, so we all kind of turned to and. We finally got in after we went around the moon and 
and got them headed home, we got a little more relaxed. And <laughs> we were looking at the consumables and we thought we could make it. Turned out, by the way, that we thought electrical power would be the short uh, consumable, but it wasn't. It was water. Uh, yeah. we, we didn't have much. Mm, we, uh, I will uh, change my uh, uh, my script. Uh, another question to Apollo 13. <laughs> There's a photo uh, of you and your colleagues cheering the splashdown uh, of Apollo 13. What key moments did you and your team witness during the mission? And are you perhaps particularly proud of one of your team's decisions or outcomes? Well, there there was a little known thing that happened that that I happened to be on duty for that was very critical. And when we got ourselves, when we shut down the uh, command and service module, entirely uh, and we had transferred we didn't have time to do an alignment in the lunar module of the inertial reference system that we had to have in order to keep up with where we were and the problem was is that with the venting oxygen and with the command module still hooked onto the front of the limb the uh, trying to align the platform using the stars, there's a zillion stars because there were all these particles um, that were following the spacecraft. Yes. So we we didn't weren't sure about that transfer of the inertial reference that we were trying to get over to the lunar module was accurate. And we did a test where we fixed some attitudes we fixed an attitude burl pitch and yaw for those of you that understand that but three axes of it we put the spacecraft in a certain attitude had the lunar module pilot fred hayes look through the um optical telescope which was fixed and if you could see any of the sun hmm. we were close enough to do maneuvers to get us on home and uh i never will forget that it still runs chills up my back uh it was in the middle of the night no the press was gone it was quiet but we had this critical thing to look at and when they did it he said i've got the sun i've got the lower quarter of the sun i was so excited wow. that when i looked back at my notes of what I was trying to record, I couldn't read them. It was, it, it, they were, you know, I couldn't read them at all. And uh, and I remember Jim Lovell and I, the commander, talking about that when we got on the ground, you know, when we when I finally saw him. And he said, that, I, I said, did you notice any uh, emotion or something when we did that AOT, the Apollo Optical Telescope check? And he said, yo, yeah, he said, <laughs> if we hadn't had that, we were in trouble. And so that little moment of success uh, did a lot, you know, on the whole mental approach to getting home. Uh, this is going to work. We, you know, we kept saying, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. We're okay. Uh, and it became more of a routine, quote, unquote, <laughs> Uh, a little more routine after we got ourselves kind of pulled together and headed home. Um, the the other big thing that I was proud of, and I was I was part of the uh, my team was on duty when it happened, was the uh, the fix on the lithium hydroxide. Lithium hydroxide hmm. has been used in submarines and spacecraft for years to scrub the atmosphere of CO2 because the crew breathes it out and it has to recirculate and you've got to get the CO2 out of it or the partial pressure of carbon dioxide builds up to the point it can kill you. And we had to figure out a way to get the, we had, we had some uh, command module uh, uh, lithium hydroxide canisters. They're like your, it's like your filter and your your home on your air conditioning and 
they had to be changed out. But we had we had a round one in the uh, in the uh, lunar module, and we had a square one in the command module. So we had to figure out how to make those two work, and that that took a little ingenuity using checklist covers and socks and and mm -hmm. a whole lot of gray tape. Yes, um, and it worked. Uh, it worked fine. But we had to read that whole thing up. In those days, we didn't have a way to. Uh, uh, today they use internet or in shuttle they had a printer that you could just uplink a new checklist to and they had it. We had to read all that up. An uh, astronaut named Joe Kerwin who later flew on Skylab did that. He did a superb job. And the one they built on the spacecraft looked just like the one that the guys in engineering had built on the ground. It was, it was pretty amazing. So it was kind of a, another small uh, thing to do, but it immediately when we taped it on there and got it over the round the square peg over the round hole, the partial pressure of CO2 in the cabin immediately uh, came down and remained that way. The we changed that canister several times. We just added to it and uh, and got them home. 